morning. Uh, I'm Candy Nelson. I'm the interim director of the Center for Congressional Presidential Studies. Um, welcome to our first of a series of uh, Latino Politics Speaker Series. Uh, this series is sponsored by an excellence for the impact grant from um, Dean Barbara Romsek. So thank you, Dean Romsek, and thank you to Saul Newman, who is the instigator of getting the grant. Um, our speaker this morning is Professor Francisco Pedraza. He's a political scientist at the University of California at Riverside with appointments in the School of Public Policy and the Department of Political Science. He's the coordinator of the Politics of Race, Immigration, and Ethnicity Consortium. Professor Pedraza's research centers on political attitude formation and political behavior with a special emphasis on the attitudes and behaviors of racial and ethnic minorities in the United States. His substantive research interests also include the relationship between immigration policy and health policy. And to that end, from 2012 to 2014, he was in residence at the University of Michigan as part of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Scholars in Health Policy Research Program. Methodologically, he specializes in design and deployment of surveys, including survey embedded experiments designed to investigate aspects of racial and ethnic minorities. Um, he received his PhD in 2010 from the University of Washington, and he's going to speak to us today on Latinos' elections and the making of cautious citizens. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Professors Newman and, and Nelson, for organizing the speaker series. Delighted to be here today, and also really happy to see one of my colleagues from the former Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Scholars in Health Policy Research, Brian. So delighted that I know uh, uh, there's going to be some things that will make a lot of sense to him when I talk about public health. And I'm going to touch on, given my title, a topic uh, that's directly related to 2016 elections, but I'm going to hold off to the end to give you the punchline on a very key and important take from the 2016 election as it relates to Latino turnout and choice. So the roadmap for today is going to be that I talked to you a little bit about the intersection of immigration and civic engagement for Latinos, and I'm going to highlight some evidence on the use of service providing bureaucracies, as well as some evidence on non-electoral participation. So that's going to be the focus of the first part. And then I'm going to pivot uh, towards the end to uh, highlight some evidence on Latinos in the 2016 election. I'm showing an image here of President Barack Obama on a tour in 2013 to increase the number of Hispanics enrolled in his key signature domestic policy, I'm referring of course to the Affordable Care Act. And in this segment, which took place on a Spanish language Univision uh, program, he is pleading with the anchors, please, please, please help me get Latinos enrolled. And this was in 2013 when there were fresh on the minds of Latinos, including these anchors, failures uh, in, at the federal level to pass comprehensive immigration reform, deep, deep, deep concerns about the patterns in the number of deportations and removals from the United States that disproportionately affect uh, Latinos. And in response, the anchors said to him, Mr. President, we'd love to help you, but we gotta talk about something. Many Latinos are actually nervous about enrolling in the ACA and participating in the exchanges. And what they explained was the reason why they were concerned was in part related to the pattern of deportations under the Obama administration, but also that the exchanges require you to share a lot of personal information. Okay, so I'm gonna get to that uh, here in just a bit about the importance of personal information uh, and how immigration policy, the politics of immigration, particularly in the developments around policing citizenship practices, how that spills over, uh, not just to the provision of health care, but also the way that Latinos uh, engage in other, with other service providing bureaucracies and how they engage in politics, particularly when it comes to non-electoral forms of politics as well. Uh, and I think this is key. I want you to keep something in mind as I'm presenting this to you. All of the data and information that I've collected here was in the context of the President uh, Obama's second administration, right? But already we're getting clear signals that there will be some implications from the research that I'm presenting here uh, and how we might have to adjust some expectations given clear signals from President-elect Trump about his intentions uh, in terms of uh, what his plans are for immigration enforcement. 
uh, and immigration politics. I'm showing you here a quote that he gave just several days ago on 60 Minutes when asked about immigration politics. He quoted the number somewhere between two and three million and the intention is to deport uh, that number of people and he says we're going to get them out of our country or we're going to incarcerate them. So this again raising the salience of immigration in the minds of Latinos. So what are the arguments that are being advanced? Well there's this literature that's been developing primarily in public policy outlets and public health outlets. And scholars in those areas claim that policing citizenship, what that does is it leads to immigration politics spilling over into health. And one of the claims that they advance is that it is driving people into the shadows, quote unquote, living in the shadows or withdrawing from public life. A second claim is that part of the reason why this is happening, uh, not just to those who are not citizens, but could potentially spill over to those who are in fact authorized to reside in the United States is because these policies, particularly policing citizenship, what it ends up have, uh, doing is conflating citizenship with ethnicity. I'm referring, of course, to racial profiling. So some broader political science theories tell us what we should uh, think about or some reasons, provide some reasons why we might anticipate people to withdraw from public engagement. Uh, one sort of uh, body of work that is collectively called the policy feedback framework says that we should think about policies as not just outcomes to be explained, but also the very causes of uh, elite as well as mass behavior responses. And when it comes to how policy can influence people's attitudes and behaviors, the argument in policy feedback uh, literature is that it does so in two ways. One is by shifting resources and allocating it in different ways, you now empower or disempower people to participate in politics. But policy can also shift people's attitudes and behaviors simply by conveying signals or messages about their place in the polity. These so-called interpretive effects tell somebody whether they're expected to be active participants in the political arena or whether they're somebody whose voice really doesn't matter and that leads to this idea that, well, since my voice doesn't really matter, why should I be engaged in the first place? And the outcome is withdrawal. The important thing about this argument is that it can have these influences on mass behavior and attitudes by shaping ideas and identities and interests. And in part because, again, the material consequences, but also because Policy can send these messages that, when reinforced over and over again, become deeply psychological. And that's basically the argument that I'm going to be advancing here today. That in the absence of comprehensive immigration reform, coupled with massive deportation and removal operations getting beefed up along the U.S.-Mexico border, as well as massive apparatuses developed in order to identify and detain individuals inside the interior of the United States, as well as massive shifts in the policymaking uh, activity that you see at sub-national levels. I'm talking about state governments as well as municipalities that target immigrants themselves, that these messages have come to reinforce in the minds of Latinos that their own ethnic identity as well as uh, citizenship status is something that needs to be saved. It's something that they should take into consideration as they're thinking about engaging government. Now, there is another framework that I want to highlight here uh, it's the political threat framework, which is important because it sort of pushes back on this narrative of living in the shadows. And when it comes to Latinos, I'd say that this has been the primary narrative and framework that has inspired the story that Latinos, in response to anti-immigrant and anti-Latino uh, uh, policies, are actually mobilized. That this spurs political activity, in part because it represents a threat to self-interest. You see in response, for example, to um, anti-immigrant, perceived anti-immigrant, anti-Latino uh, policies that Latinos feel compelled to collect information so they know more about government, for example. Uh, they're more likely to naturalize, they're more likely to uh, register to vote and then turn out on election days. This is very uh, carefully documented in patterns that came out of um, observing Latino political behavior in the state of California in response to Pete Wilson um, as well as a ballot initiative uh, on the California ballot in 1994 called Proposition 187, which effectively deputized 
public bureaucrats to inquire whenever someone was going to apply for public programs or social uh, welfare programs to inquire about their citizenship status and to identify people who were suspected of being undocumented immigrants. And so the question is, this was always sort of understood as a threat to perceived or potential uh, political threats, or responses to pol potential political threats, as the case of Proposition 187, uh, uh, people have documented. But what we don't know is what is the effect uh, on, uh, of deportations themselves? What is the effect of Trump's rhetoric, for example? Um, now these questions I won't be able to answer today, but I'm going to show you uh, basically how this spillover that public health scholars are claiming now translates uh, when we cue people. Just, just a simple mention of the term immigration and what that does then when we ask them, now how likely are you to go, for example, to uh, make a doctor's appointment? How likely are you to engage with other service providing bureaucracies like police or educators? And then I'm going to show you some evidence on what that does for the propensity to participate in non-electoral forms of politics. Okay, so today, in this part one, what we're gonna look at and focus on is to what extent does policing citizenship push people into the shadows? And how does experience with policing citizenship inform attitudes about information privacy with healthcare providers? Remember that piece of uh, uh, little tidbit knowledge and response that those Univision anchors gave to President Obama suggesting that there's a real concern and a wariness about uh, sharing personal information with an impersonal interface, right? You sign up for the exchanges, you're not interacting with a bureaucrat, you're just typing in personal information, and the question is, what are people doing with that information? Well, I'm gonna talk about how information privacy can also be something that's important or salient at different parts of the long chain of healthcare provision. So not just signing up for the exchanges, but what happens when you actually get into the offices with healthcare providers like doctors and nurses and are asked to share private information, personal information. So from, for today I'm gonna to call some evidence that I collected on the 2015 National Latino and Immigrant Health Survey. This was a collaborative survey. We had something like four or five scholars who pitched in money basically to field a set of questions that covered a wide range of topics like self-rated uh, uh, psychological distress and health as well as physical health. And I included on this survey some items that asked people about how likely they were to avoid uh, interacting with service providing uh, bureaucracies, how likely they were to uh, schedule an appointment to see a healthcare provider, as well as uh, how likely they were to engage in things like donating money, signing a petition, marching, or attending meetings. Now some things that are going to be important to keep in mind here, especially as we talk about part two of the lecture, and we'll pivot there after I show you this evidence, is the importance of getting it right when you interview Latinos. It is so critical, it is so critical that when you go to interview Latinos that you provide not only a range of different ways or modes to interview them, because it turns out a lot of Latinos don't have landlines, they're viewing the web and they're making calls through their mobile phones, but it's also critical that you provide the instrument in Spanish language. And in the case of the 2015 National Latino and Immigrant Health Survey, 58% of the respondents elected, were given the option, elected to take and complete the survey in Spanish language. So that's key. We need to know that that information, um, or that that is, option is available because that tells us that we've done a good job of getting a representative sample then of Hispanic political uh, attitudes. So I embedded this survey experiment, and I want to walk you through some of the nitty gritty of that experiment so that you understand how I was able to leverage this to then compare people's responses for both this quote unquote withdrawal from public engagement ordinary forms of everyday life activities, uh, as well as non-electoral participation. So it went something like this. I basically randomized whether someone was cued or received a cue on health issues or whether they received a cue on immigration issues, okay? So some people got a reminder or a, a, a prime to think about health issues. Others got a prime around immigration issues. And then we just basically asked them, are you more likely to make an appointment to see a doctor or a nurse or go to a clinic for healthcare services? Less likely or has it not made a difference? Now if we take those news anchors on Univision at their word, what they're suggesting is that 
immigration issues, because they're so deeply psychologically embedded in the minds of Latinos, that that might be a deterrent when it comes to answering this question here. Not answering the question, but at least making an appointment uh, to see a doctor or a nurse. So this is what I find is the response among Latinos when they get just the health issue cue. When they get the health issue cue, you see that about 29% or so are saying that they're more likely to make an appointment to see a healthcare provider. The majority say that there's no difference, and there's a few, about 10% that say they're less likely. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the health issues cue, is that also something that would have an element of threat or fear, so it sort of primes them on? Nope. If you don't go to your healthcare provider, then your risk is nope. more near. Nope, it was really what simple. It was, it was a simple cue that talked about, hey, there's been a lot of talk in the news about health. That was it. That was hey, it. there's been a lot of talk about Immigration, that was it, nothing else. So on the immigration queue, I'm glad you raised that uh, question as well because I didn't hit them overhead with, hey, President Obama is, uh, has been, um, uh, people have been addressing President Obama about a concern for the level of deportations in the country. There are estimates that over two million over the course of his administration have been removed. Nothing like that hard over their head. It was just immigration or just health. So this was the response among those who received the cue for the health issues. Yeah. Um, did you mention the age range that you surveyed at you? I didn't mention it, but I can talk to you about that. Yeah. It matches very closely to what we get from the current population survey of the Latino adult population. Right. So I'm not interviewing kids here. Uh, and let me add one other point. All of these individuals here are U.S. citizens. All of them. These are US citizens, either through naturalization or because they were born in the United States. About 29% say they're more likely, when I cue them to think about health issues, to make an appointment to see a healthcare provider. This is the response in darker points of those who say that they're likely to make an appointment to see a healthcare provider when you cue them to think about immigration. So just cueing the term immigration drops the percentage or the proportion to say that they're more likely by about eight points. So the sort of hunch that these anchors had on, on the Univision uh, uh, cable news network in engaging President Obama when he was asking them, please get people to enroll, seems to be corroborated here by this evidence. But I want to show you is sort of whether this is a pattern that is exclusive only to healthcare or is it something that spills over into other service providing bureaucracies. So what I did is I basically put together this battery of questions that ask people, do you avoid X type of activity because you don't want to be bothered or asked about your citizenship status? Again, only among US Latinos who are citizens. That's it. You're either naturalized or you're born in the US, so you're a citizen. And I ask them things like, do you avoid talking with the police or reporting crime? 16% said yes. Do you avoid driving a car? 14% said yes. How about renewing or applying for a driver's license? Another 14% said yes. Visiting a doctor or clinic? and talking with educators. These that I highlight in three, notice this is the response, the percentage of people who say they avoid talking with police, visiting a doctor, or talking with educators. These are all service providing bureaucracies. Okay, so this impacts policy implementation and service delivery. But it also has implications for just quotidian forms of everyday <coughs> life, getting around, uh, whether through public transportation or driving a car. So what I want to know is, did the responses to these questions, did they vary as a function of what cue they received, whether it was health or immigration? I asked all these questions after I did that manipulation. And what I found was that those who received the health cue, this is the pattern in response to the proportion, excuse me, of Latino citizens who say that they avoid going to airport, the DMV, car, bus, school, clinic, and police. And this dotted line represents sort of the average level of reticence or avoidance of these daily life activities. I'm going to show you what it looks like when we cue those Latinos to think about immigration. Okay? This is what happens. The percentage of people who avoid these activities, there's a marked uptick. Less so around these quotidian forms, everyday life, like just getting around town. But it really stands out in these questions about contact with service providing bureaucrats, whether those are educators, healthcare providers, or law enforcement officials. And you shouldn't be surprised, right, and I'm not, that it's especially high around law enforcement officials. 
Okay, so the average uh, avoidance there being about uh, uh, five points, much higher for uh, police. Now, I followed up with that battery of questions to ask whether people would uh, be likely in the future to donate money, to sign a petition, to attend meetings, or participate in a march. And I did the same thing. I basically compared those who received the health cue versus those who received the cue about immigration. And this corroborates this idea of political threat. So on the one hand, we have some evidence here that says public health scholars are nailing it. They got it right. There is, in fact, some evidence that says people are deterred from engaging in social programs and uh, service providing bureaucracies when the topic of immigration is at the top of their mind. And at the same time, those who study political threat and find evidence of political mobilization, at least when it comes to electoral politics, right, this is complemented in these patterns for non-electoral politics. So in response to immigration, which we imagine is cueing these negative valence or threat kinds of considerations, this spurs people to get involved in politics. I want to follow up sort of thinking about what are the mechanisms behind this. I suggested that the uh, news anchors in describing to President Obama some concerns about sharing personal information that we could investigate this a little bit more by just asking people, what statement do you agree with most about personal information that you provide to doctors and healthcare providers? Do you think it's secure and kept private? Or do you think it's sometimes shared and not always secure? I wanted to make it so that it was subtle, but that we could pick up distinctions. Um, so I'm not asking people, hey, do you think that your doctor is going to share your personal information with immigration authorities? It's just very subtle. What's your view? What's your take on personal information uh, being shared? It turns out that about one in four say that, yeah, information is sometimes shared and not always secured. And I wanted to know, could we explain this in a regression analysis on that same um, on that same survey, I collected this information before the manipulation. So I have in a regression model controls for whether somebody knows a person who's been deported, whether they're foreign born, whether they're insured, whether they're, uh, how many times they visited the doctor in the last year, as well as a host of standard uh, socioeconomic and demographic uh, controls. And what I'm trying to explain is, do you express the skeptical attitude that you think personal information is not secure? And what explains that? And what I find is that if you know someone who's been deported, you're about 33%, these are uh, odds ratios, you're about 33% more likely to say, yeah, I believe that personal information is not secure. We find that women and those who are insured are less likely to say that information is not secure. Uh, I have a hunch about this, by the way. I think that it's in large measure because those who are engaging, um, not just among Latinos, but in general, engaging service providing bureaucracies tend to be women, especially when it comes to concerns about taking kids to the doctor, taking kids to school, et cetera, et cetera. I want to show you what the difference is in terms of just predicted probability when we plot out across the range of age what is the probability that somebody will express skepticism that information is not secure, depending on whether they know somebody who's been deported or not? This is the trace that shows across the full range of age values, you get basically from about 18% to about 26% probability that a Latino will say, a Latino citizen will say that uh, information is not secure. But when you look at those who know somebody who's been deported, it is a little bit higher. The skepticism sort of goes up. And I think that's corroborating this concern uh, that's out there about the willingness of Latinos to share personal information given a perception that there could be service, uh, there could be linkages between service providing bureaucracies and immigration uh, authorities. So I put in my title this idea of cautious citizen uh, because what I'm tinkering with is this possibility that on the one hand, uh, you have people who are spurred by political threat, and on the other hand, you have them systematically withdrawing from public life. But it's not willy-nilly. They're doing this in a rational sort of way, I believe. I think you uh, can explain this by thinking about people being measured or cautious, right, about their willingness to expose themselves or loved ones to the possibility right, that they might be identified, which could be later lead to d detention uh, or deportation. And the important thing is, is that we've now added some uh, information to the evidence base that corroborates these concerns that have been widely expressed in public health uh, uh, literature about living in the shadows. 
but at the same time, not losing sight of these key political science uh, claims that show threat does, in fact, mobilize um, civic engagement. I want to uh, run through some of these implications for healthcare just briefly, and then I'm going to pivot. Um, I'll ask you to uh, give me any questions on this first part right now, but there's one key point that I want to make sure that we walk away with uh, when I talk about Latinos in the 2016 election. Um, so get your, your, get your questions ready. Um, President-elect Trump and the question of constraining on police and citizens, I think, sort of raises additional questions uh, uh, and possibilities about the concern that I'm, uh, I'm drawing attention to here. Um, in part because of the strong signal that he said, the intention to yeah, deport two to three million people, uh, and questions about how is that actually going to get done. Um, it also raises some questions about uh, the efforts to address health inequities. On the one hand, we touted the ACA as a key contrib the contributing factor towards reducing inequities, uh, but what I'm showing you here suggests that even if we are successful in uh, providing coverage across the population, that for this key segment, Latinos, including those, uh, uh, including U.S. citizens, they may still, uh, we may still see that the gap uh, in health inequities may not close to the degree that we anticipated for reasons that go beyond coverage. Uh, and then I want to highlight right, that if that means that people are deterred from seeing healthcare providers, this could actually paradoxically lead to uh, cost increases rather than the expectation that the ACA was going to lower um, costs. Why? Because people in avoiding seeing healthcare providers will wait until things get really bad and then they'll attend or then they'll show up to see, uh, see a doctor. Okay, so let me take some questions and then I'll pivot over here to the Latino election poll so that I can give you one key takeaway um, about Latinos in the 2016 election. I think I saw a hand here and then I'll go over to one. Yes. Can you explain the fear with U.S. citizens? In other words, this population, they're all U.S. citizens, and yet the fear rate that they have will climb in certain areas, and there would be no chance of deportation. So could you talk about that? Sure, sure. Uh, I'll push back just very slightly on the no chance of deportation. In fact, there's a history of uh, the United States um, responding towards groups uh, including Latinos with mass deportation. So in the 1920s and the 1950s, U.S. citizens were deported, in fact, uh, most of whom, not exclusively, but many of whom were of Mexican origin. Uh, and then two, we also know, and this is a signal that we just picked up from a surrogate of President-elect Trump, that the Japanese internments are a precedent for setting up the Muslim registry, right? And those were U.S. citizens. So I, I, th I think there is I mean, I don't want to give too much credit to ordinary people and like mastering major historical patterns in the United States, but I think there is sort of a real fear and it's palpable. Now, the other reasons why U.S. citizens might feel reluctant to uh, engage service providing bureaucracies is because we know in filling out forms that uh, ask us for information, especially means-tested forms, that the information they collect isn't just on the individual that's applying, they collect it on the whole household. Okay, and so that's one way that that gets connected. Uh, it also matters uh, whether or not you're applying, actually submitting an application for uh, a welfare program or some kind of social service program. That public charge laws that have been in effect for 200 years may stymie people or may, may uh, deter people from engaging with service providing bureaucracies out of, uh, uh, out of a worry that this would spoil future efforts to adjust immigration status. The public charge provision in immigration law basically says, look, you're on a pathway to citizenship and everything's gonna be fine unless you are, and there's a long list of things like, unless you're an idiot, a lunatic, a rapist, or a public charge. And the concern is that any kind of evidence that says, oh, you've, uh, uh, you've been uh, um, a participant in this or that welfare uh, or social or a public program would be used against you in an application to adjust your, your citizenship status or somebody that you love. Yes? Yeah, um, so there are obviously <clears throat> some striking patterns in the attitudes and the sort of hypothetical behaviors that you have people think about. And I wondered if you thought about actually trying to get some behavior measures, like putting a petition in there and just actually measuring the fraction of sign to make things more concrete and less people? Yeah, that's and, it. Uh, sorry, yeah. in a second, I, I wondered what you thought of the, the sort of more likely, less likely, 
television, right? Like what it means to disengage, it could be that there are a lot more people who say I'm less likely to make a doctor's appointment as opposed to fewer people who say I'm more likely. So some interpretation of that first finding. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been, I'm glad you asked that, Ryan. Um, I, you know, first, there's, no, there's not much difference in the less likely. Right. Um, where you do see a bit of a difference is in terms of no difference. Uh, um, so people who get exposed to that immigration queue are more like to say, no, no, this doesn't really matter to me. And so I'm sorting out, like, what is it that's, that's driving that? And to your first point, I think that's excellent, and that's the next stage of research that I'm conducting. I'm in the field now doing that very, uh, very thing on the CCDS. Yes? Did you ever disaggregate your data based on the country of origin of the people that took the survey? And I mean, if so, would you expect to see a difference? Uh, I, I haven't done that, and in large measure because this was a national sample. And when you are looking at <coughs> national samples, the overwhelming number of Latinos are going to come from Mexico, and I'll have just I just didn't have enough information to make reasonable statements uh, and, con and with any confidence about other national origins, including uh, those from Puerto Rico or Cuba or Central American countries. Um, but that's a, a good idea um, for future research. What I have been able to do with this is take a look at what the responses were to avoiding service providing bureaucracies in everyday life by whether you know somebody who's undocumented or not, whether you know somebody who's been deported. And in all, all these cases, the direction that you'd expect, that is, people who get the immigration queue would be on average more likely to avoid these kinds of things. It, that gap increases among those who know somebody who's undocumented or know somebody who's been deported. So I can parse out the data in, in that way. Yes? So you just answered part of the question I wanted to ask, but um, I guess I'm really curious about what some of the mechanisms are. I mean, I think this is really fascinating. Um, and it, the fact that this relationship is stronger among those who know someone who's undocumented suggests one of the mechanisms. Um, but I guess I was also curious um, the question that you uh, looked at, I don't know if you, where it was, uh, landed in the survey, but the, the question about um, what was the what did the you information? Get after this? Yeah, yeah. So um, so does that have you tried interacting that the uh, whether or not they think information gets shared with that gap? Because I wonder if it's the people who believe that information does get shared that react to that um, prime, whereas maybe people who think information is safe. Don't right. I, ha I, have, I have done that, and part of the trick with this particular data set is that I, it, the design wasn't, it wasn't designed to get at that question. Because what you're asking is, is, does it mediate that? Yeah, exactly. And, and that, the placement of this question doesn't let me get at that. that. But in the next round of data collection, that's exactly what I'm doing. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think your instincts are, th that's my instinct, is, as well. Is that some of it? I mean, it's hard to know. Like, is it that you have um, this sort of context where immigration is salient and it's salient in a particular direction that spills over at, to attitudes or concerns about sharing personal information that drives responses to this question? Or is it that you just have people who are predisposed to be skeptical about sharing personal information in the first place? And so, got to get busy sorting that out first. Shall I pivot really quickly? I had to run through this really quickly, but I, I just want to make sure that I leave you with, I think, a, a key um, sort of lesson. If there's one thing about the 2016 uh, presidential election in Latinos that I ask you, please, please take away, it's a skepticism and a rejection of the national exit poll figures that report Latinos supported Donald Trump at, at the tune of 29%. Let me explain why. Um, Okay, so this is evidence I'm going to show you really quickly from an election eve poll that was conducted by Latino Decisions. It was fielded in 12 different states for a total of 5,600 Latino voters. Um, and uh, it was done just before the election from November 4th through the 7th. At the national level, we have uh, margins of errors uh, that plus or minus 1.8. At the state levels, um, you have margin of errors, for example, in Florida that are about 3.5%. Uh, so we did sort of our best to try to get good evidence on Latino voters. Uh, and I'm going to show you some of the key points here about their methodology and contrast it to the national exit polls. 
and explain why that's fueling my skepticism. Okay, so remember what I said earlier about the importance of interviewing Latinos in English or Spanish <coughs> language? We left this to the discretion at point of contact, that is when people were called either on a landline, cell, or when they participated online. Um, respondents in this sample are extremely high propensity voters that were screened on vote history. So we know, for example, um, whether they voted the last election cycle, the one before that, the one before that, and that gives us some evidence about who's likely to turn out then uh, for the 2016 election. And then this is key because we establish here that we've got representative samples within each state that we then weight to match census demographics. And that's what gives me the confidence to say these numbers are pretty darn good, okay? And that seems like, okay, are we gonna be focusing here on the methodological minutia? And we, we are, but I'm gonna explain to you why I think it's important for policy reasons uh, and understanding the narrative about Latino, uh, Latinos in the election. So here's the breakdown of the Latino vote according to this election eve poll in 2016, remember, fielded the 4th of November through the 7th. Overall, 79% reported support for Hillary Clinton, this is Latino voters, 18% said they backed Trump. That's about 10 percent points lower than what the national exit polls uh, reported. And of course you would see that when we look at state by state, there are variations, just as you might expect. In Florida, the support for Clinton was slightly lower than you see among other, uh, the Latinos in other states, including Arizona, California, Colorado, North Carolina, Nevada. So we've got a nice range of what we would call traditional <laughs> Latino states, as well as those that are key battleground states, Ohio and Wisconsin. So even those states where you don't think, oh, lots of Latinos live in Ohio and in Wisconsin. Uh, no, there's not, but among those that we were able to capture in our survey, still the number breaks down to about 80-20. Okay, so now, the national exit polls, where do they come from? Here's some questions that you should be asking when you consume this information. The Edison National Exit Poll, we should ask, how did they arrive at the 65-29 number for Latinos? Uh, in order to assess that, we need to know which precincts did they select. How many of those that they selected were in Latino neighborhoods? How many of the interviews that were conducted were, uh, were done so in Spanish? And finally, did they match the Latino sample to any known census demographics as a way to sort of like adjust or weight to what we know is sort of the truth out there about the Latino population? And this is what we know. The Latino voter demographics in both the census and Latino decisions poll that I just described match up pretty darn closely. So when it comes to national origins, there's not much in the way of discrepancies. When it comes to levels of education, they're fairly similar. About 30% in the census uh, uh, have a college education. In the Latino decisions election eve poll, about 33.4%. When the national exit polls reported, by the way, I'm putting question marks here, but now we have this broken down by uh, ethnicity, and they report that about 44% uh, of, of racial and ethnic minorities have a college degree, which to me says this is way off. Like this is, there's no way that it could be that high, and that gives me a clue that they may have left out people who are systematically uh, uh, more likely to report or prefer to take the survey in Spanish language. Okay, so uh, some national exit poll uh, uh, points here. 40% of their sample they did report come from pre-election telephone poll or early poll. Everybody is doing this. The exit polls aren't just exclusively conducted outside of the polling stations. Some are also done uh, prior to the election by phone. And 60% of their sample comes from a small handful of precincts in each state. And we argue that they're not representative of Latinos. For example, in the 2014 exit poll, they selected zero precinct locations in the Rio Grande Valley. And this, for the state of Texas, is a no-no because 25% of all Latinos uh, live in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas. Not 25% of all Latinos in the country, I mean, within the state of Texas, 25% are located at the U.S.-Mexico border. So, um, who do they count as Hispanic or Latino? Well, they basically have this race or ethnicity question that lets people identify with a primary race uh, or, or ethnicity. Then they have these follow-up questions. And the reason I point this out is because they report extreme differences in the book preferences uh, according to these different types of quote-unquote um, Hispanics. So there is some evidence that at the very least they're acknowledging that you have to take into consideration the diversity of the Latino uh, electorate because they're not all likely to vote um, for, for uh, the Republican or the Democrat Party at the same levels. Um, so my point here, I'm going to sort of fast forward here, is that according to the census about 
50% of Latinos live in majority Latino neighborhoods. 22% live in neighborhoods that are 20 to 25% uh, Latino, and about a third are uh, living in neighborhoods where um, uh, the population or composition of uh, the neighborhood is 25% uh, Latino or less. So my question is, can we get some answers on whether the national exit polls selected precincts that are distributed along this same distribution? And the answer is, I don't know, and you probably won't be able to find that out either. I've searched long and hard on the web. But it raises questions about how then we can trust this 65-29 uh, number. By the way, you don't have to take my word for this. Uh, the guru of polling, I understand he's a little bruised right now, but what he said about the uh, uh, exit polls was that um, they show Trump making bigger gains among black and Hispanic voters than among whites, but we need to exercise some caution. Uh, and he says, uh, in fact, um, compared with pre-election polls, Trump clearly overperformed the most in whiter states. So on second thought, maybe that's a lot of caution and not just a little. I'm not here to talk about, like, what should we trust these polls? I mean, I can comment on that. Uh, I'm not here to say, like, what is the right accurate number for non-Hispanic whites? I don't know. That's not my thing. But I can tell you what I know about Latino voters and the 6529 number um, just isn't right. Finally, I just want to point this out from Edison Matofsky. This is in 2004 after the national election pool. Uh, this was released in January of 2005 uh, following the 2004 election. They themselves, the authors of the uh, national exit polls said, but it is not designed to yield very reliable estimates of characteristics of small geographically clustered demographic groups. These groups have much larger design effects and thus larger sampling errors. Uh, so we should be cautious. Uh, if we want to improve the national exit poll estimate for Hispanic votes, uh, we would either need to drastically increase the number of precincts in the national sample, i.e. those in Texas and the Rio Grande Valley, or oversample the number of Hispanic precincts. So even the authors of the national exit poll Right, say we should be very cautious about using this as a tool to make statements about um, subgroups. So finally, I want to show you that uh, there's some real neat data when we look at the actual reports by precinct level, when I go to county level election returns websites and scrape it from the actual Canvas reports. Uh, before I show you that, I'm going to show you that in addition to the Latino Decisions Election Eve poll, you can look at what the breakout was in other um, uh, polling houses, Univision, NBC, Naleo, and the Florida International University, New Latino Voice, and in none of those did Trump get more than 20%. Okay. So it's not just something that's unique to the election poll, election eve poll that was done by Latino Decision. This is across uh, the board. So, real election data, and I'll just show you a couple of highlights here. Uh, I can, if you want, show you a lot of other states, but I just want to sort of put a fine point on this. That when I go to election, county election clerk websites, I can take the counties that are highly Hispanic. So in the state of Texas, that's along the Rio Grande Valley, uh, Star, Jim Hogg, Maverick, Webb, Zavala, Brooks. These are all counties in the state of Texas where the entire population, as well as the citizen voting age population, exceeds 90% Hispanic. Okay, So that's key because... Uh, this would be the place, right, where if you were going to see an accurate breakdown of voter choice, and as well as turnout, if you wanted to make statements about that, you'd know with some confidence that this is being driven primarily by Latinos. It's not any other group that's driving the results here. And when it comes to the uh, breakdown of, uh, vote between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, you see that it basically never reaches 29%. And as you go down in the percentage of Hispanics, you see a slight uptick in the percentage of share that goes for Donald Trump. But we know like what would explain that. Well, now that's fewer and fewer Latinos that are composing the actual electorate in that county. Um, I can show you this for a lot of other states, a deeper look at the precinct level. So going from the counties down to voting districts. And you see in each case that the change, uh, I'm showing here in this column, the change uh, Democrat and the change uh, Republican. And this change Republican column is negative basically across the board with the exception of two precincts. It's change Democrat is positive across the board. So that tells us that Latinos overwhelmingly supported Hillary Clinton, rejected, or at least relative to the support that they offered Romney in 2012, offered much less support in 2016 for the Republican uh, candidate. Turnout. Uh, when it comes to turnout, a lot of people were wondering, <coughs> did Latinos just stay home? Maybe that's what was going on uh, in some of these other states outside of the highly concentrated Latino states. 
Well, uh, this pattern here, which is for Texas, and not, it's not a battleground state, it's not competitive uh, at the national level, we saw increases in turnout from 2012 to 2016, ranging from two points to 10 points in those highly uh, Hispanic um, uh, composition uh, counties. Um, I'm gonna show you that it's the same thing goes on with other states in the Southwest like Arizona, but I'm gonna show you that this is in fact the case even in Florida, where you might wonder like, oh, maybe there was this like massive turnout among Cuban Americans who are known to identify more with the GOP than other national origin uh, Hispanics. We found that when it came to turnout, Cuban Americans didn't stay home in the Miami-Dade uh, precincts. There was an increased uh, uh, mobilization from 2012 to 2016. And when we look at how they distributed their, uh, allocated their votes between the Democratic uh, candidate and the Republican candidate for the presidency, we see that, again, across the board, when you look at precincts in Miami-Dade, it's generally negative when we compare 2012 support for the GOP to 2016. Uh, and it's positive when we compare support for Obama relative to support for Clinton. That is, Clinton gained in Miami-Dade precincts. And you might be wondering, maybe this is just something that was funky over in Miami-Dade, but when we look over at Central Florida and Kissimmee, where there has been an influx of Puerto Rican voters, the same pattern holds, guys. So <coughs> this is like just more and more evidence that, that I just don't buy the 29% of Latino supported uh, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, rather than hitting you over the head with more and more of this, if there's a particular state that you want to look at, I'm happy to like put it up. Uh, but I'll open it up to uh, questions about that number, uh, about this number, if you if you have any. So yeah. Your numbers, your original numbers, are from the November fourth to eighth. Seven. Seven. Okay. Yeah. On the election eve poll, and then this is actual vote data. Like we go to the clerk's mm -hmm. websites and we scrape that information off of their canvas reports, where it's available. It's not available everywhere just yet. Anything else? Yeah. So in the, it's the election age was Latino decisions data? Yeah. yeah. So in that data, you should be able to see whether or not some of these covariants that you've suggested would skew the polls or the exit polls are in fact leading you closer to that 30, 70 breakdown. You see what I'm saying? Like if you look at people who took it in English and maybe are in a neighborhood that's not predominantly Latino. Have you tried playing with yep. the data like that? Let me show you. It gives you a similar? Yeah. Okay, so some might argue that Latino vote in high density Hispanic neighborhoods, that that skews more Democrats. So what we need to do is take a look at, within our own data, what about those Hispanics? And this is something that National Exit Poll says. Well, maybe you're just not picking up enough on those Latinos that live in areas that are predominantly non-Hispanic. So I'm showing you here with my high-tech data output. <laughs> the distribution of Latinos, uh, the breakdown between Clinton and Trump um, clustered into Latino density census tracts. So we took those 5,600 Latinos that we interviewed and we said, let's look at what the breakdown is among those who live in census tracts that are uh, 0 to 25% uh, Hispanic, 25 to 50% Hispanic, and then majority Hispanic, 50 to 75, or super majority, 75 to 100. And in each of these cases, right, the support for Clinton, it does go down, right, but it doesn't go down by the levels that the national exit poll would suggest. The lowest it reaches for Clinton is 73%, and for Trump, 23%, nowhere near the 29%. And remember what I said about where Latinos, are, where they, where, where Latinos predominantly live. 50% of Latinos live in these kinds of tracks, where they're majority in their neighborhoods, right? So far fewer live in this area, which means that y you would have to have, like, it would have to be flipped around in order to get that kind of number, and this would have to skew in the, uh, even deeper in favor uh, of uh, the GOP candidate. So that, we, we didn't find that. That definitely wasn't the case. I, I, I guess what I was uh, suggesting is, what if you reweight everything to make it look like what you think, who you think they pull, and see if that gives you uh, a similar okay. number? And as opposed to waiting for what the nation looks like. Does that yeah, make sense? I, yeah, I could do that. It just seems like, I, look, like part of me says like, I'm not going to do that because then it's going to say, I don't want to do that work for them. I want them to just tell me, where did you get, where, where were the precincts from? Tell me the information that we needed to know to like evaluate uh, these figures rather than me do this indirect form to guess it 
like, oh, we think that you must have interviewed Latinos primarily in these kinds of locations. It's like, I mean, I, I, I yeah, appreciate yeah. the idea, but... Well, I, I mean, the com combination, too, right? Like, the only English, and then if you layer that on top of this, does that get you closer to that? Be, I don't know, just, that would, I, would, I would buy your argument even more if, if I saw something like that. <laughs> it's just another angle to try to... Sure, sure. But I want to put a quick fine point on this, guys. The reason why this is, like, uh, important is that when you get the signals from candidate Trump right now about deporting two to three million people, uh, moving forward with the Muslim registry, uh, all, like it, it makes it, I think, a little bit easier to deploy these kinds of hyper-restrictive policies if you can make a claim that the population that is going to be hit very hard by this actually backed him. Right? And even if it seems like, well, 29%, that's so, well, one in three says a very different story than, say, one in six, right? If you, if you, if you say one in six back this guy, that's a very different sort of political ground you're standing on than if you say one in three. Uh, so how do anyway, you change that, that narrative? Out. Because that, the exit poll was a big find that, you know, that Trump did better among Latinos than Romney. You, you, you say, um, you say this. The numbers that I just shared with you, and you say, darn it, I don't have it, you can see. Well, I'm going to no look cycle through this real quick. Um, there's a figure, a really key and important figure. I don't have it up here. Darn it. We, we asked Latinos in 2012, do you think that candidate Romney truly cares, doesn't care, or is hostile towards Latinos. And in 2012, 18% of Latinos said, candidate Mitt Romney is hostile towards Latinos. We repeated that same question and asked it of candidate Trump. And the response there was way higher than 18. It was 55%. So that to me, that figure alone tells me, like, I just can't square a 65-29 breakdown, which suggests that he got two points more than Mitt Romney when 55% relative to 18% said that they viewed him as hostile towards Latinos. It just doesn't square. So that's, what, that's how I would push back. And I'd say, one, we don't know about the national exit polling methodology. We need to know what's the nitty gritty. And then two, given that Latinos' views of candidate Trump were way more negative than Mitt Romney, it just doesn't make any sense. So I don't buy it. Yeah, you had your hand up, sir. My question is kind of set back now from where the conversations developed, but I was curious in the polling results for California. Yeah. Can you see what the breakdown for that state is like? I don't have polling results, but I can show you state the election results. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I can show you that. So this is California. Uh, okay. So California, very nearly across the board again, uh, decline in the share uh, support for. Um, candidate Trump relative to candidate Romney. Uh, and then I'm showing here what is the distribution of support for Trump as you move across the percentage of Latino citizen voting age population within a precinct. So each of these dots are voting precincts. And I've got imposed here uh, a regression line that shows what the relationship is between these two variables for Trump, and that's the solid red line, as well as the dashed red line for Romney. And what it shows is that in California, right, the relationship, the line that tracks that relationship is always above the line for Trump. That is, Trump is just lower across the entire range of the percentage of Latinos in a voting district in terms of Latino support for Trump vote within those precincts. So that, I mean, that to me is like more evidence that even in a place that's not a battleground state, where you might have anticipated people would stay home, they just weren't mobilized to participate, they didn't get out, like the quote unquote uh, Trump effect, it would have stopped at the California border because like, what are they gonna, it's already gonna go blue, there's no sort of like incentive to mobilize like you saw uh, in Florida. But even there, you saw, this is not true, Trump didn't get more support than Romney, he got less, yeah. So I don't know if this is specifically connected to your research or just your general knowledge. It seems like when that Pew 
Hispanic research report came out and said, yeah, the Trump effect will send people out, but that Hillary Clinton did not have strong support. Then I feel like in the news we saw for a few days, everybody's mobilizing the Latino vote and they're going to get out and vote and a lot have voted early and therefore that's going to have a big effect. So in the end, like, was the turnout significantly <coughs> better than, let's say, 2012? I mean, did, for whatever reason, more Latinos yes, vote? Or yes, is, it was. Or is it still a little bit disappointing? No, no, it, it, was, it was higher than we saw in 2012. And that's why I, thought I did show those charts on turnout. But here's where I, wanna, I would add a note of caution about the Trump effect. I, I think that there probably was some degree of mobilization, but I don't want to discount the incredible levels of investment and commitment that started after 2012 to do get out the vote efforts long before the election. So a lot of the sort of beefed up turnout came as a result of civic organizations, lots of nonprofit organizations getting in on the ground in 2014. And that to me is like a, that's a, that's a more sort of plausible explanation given that one, we have a long historical pattern of under, uh, vo uh, underperformance among Latinos in terms of like turnout. Uh, and then two, that the idea that like you just get mobilized at the very last minute um, given the sort of a, uh, other developments with respect to the Voting Rights Act and how uh, slightly more difficult to challenging it can be to register to vote, find a polling place, actually turn out, et cetera, et cetera. Like that, those are institutional barriers that we know matter. And so if there was a systematic uh, boost in Latino turnout, uh, despite those developments, I don't think it was just Trump's rhetoric. It had to be boots on the ground, long in advance, investing, in that's what it is. So you're talking about like MALDEV, NCLR, Latino, all these groups that got people registered, got them to the polls, those were major factors that had been going on oh, for yeah. several years. Yeah, oh yeah. It started with ground, ground level movements to get people naturalized uh, in the first place, then registered. And all those things is just hard to do in the span of a couple of weeks or even a couple of months. I mean, it takes time. So that's what I would credit, or at least I wouldn't, wouldn't discount that. No, I thought that was important. I guess my point is in the end, was the turnout, certainly was it as strong as it could be, and if not, what would be some of the factors too? Oh yeah, it was definitely strong. It was way more than, than the we saw in 2012, among Latinos. Yeah, okay, I saw uh, over here, and then I'll come back to you. Um, so, <clears throat> this is my own ignorance, right? But when we talk about, um, Trump outperforming Romney uh, in the exit polls. What's the baseline? Where are we getting information about Romney from? Like, what's the baseline? For, for, for mine or for no, the national exit people polls? Talk when, they, when they make that comparison, what is, what is, what is the baseline for Latino support for Romney that they're using <laughs> to generate that, that difference? Ah, okay. So when it comes to the survey, the public opinion surveys, Latino decisions had election <laughs> polls. No, no, no. But, but like, so, but the, the argument that the specific argument is 65-29 versus sure. what, right? Like when they say they outperform, you know, Trump outperformed Romney by X number, two points, five points, whatever. Like wh where's the, you know, wh what's the reference point that those people are using when they make that argument? S the 65-29 number? No, no, that's the exit poll, right? But right. I mean, like, the 2012. But so is it the 2012 exit poll? Is that what they're... I guess, I'm sorry, I guess I'm just I'm not, I'm not understanding so what you're So if you asking. want to say that candidate in the later time period outperformed, you know, the candidate, the previous candidate, I, this, the comparison is between the 2016 exit poll versus the 2012 exit poll, is that correct? That's right. When, when the national exit poll reports, when they have a line that says, Latinos in 2016 yeah. supported the GOP candidate this right. year more than they did in 2012, they're comparing it to the 2012 right. exit poll. So, That's right. So the question then that I would have is, what is it? that makes you not believe that that's a sort of apples to apples comparison, right? Like, I believe that that's not necessarily representative, right? But like, what are the biases that are baked in in 2016 that are, were not baked in in 2012, 
Right. So, no, you're right. It is systematic because in 2012, they did the same, I presume, kinds of methodology and approaches to getting the precincts in the first place. So it was bad in 2012 and it was bad in 2016 but to so the same then, degree. But then that leaves intact the idea that Trump outperformed Romney, right? If you're comparing apples to apples and in that case, well, I mean, we, can, we, sure, I, sure. We, we don't have to argue about the distributions, right? Because I agree with you that I don't think they're representative, but, but, but I mean, like, if the basic notion is that Trump did better than among a, a certain group, in 2016, sure. I mean, uh, there's no way to settle who has the right answer, right? Sure, I mean, there right? is. Well, sure, I just did, and, and I'll push back on the on the on that. Okay. The presumption here is that when we say that the 29 percent from the national exit polls is is accurate, or there's no way to discern whether that's accurate. You're right. I'm not. I, all I'm saying is that it's not representative of Latinos, and the only no, way for so, us to so, ascertain whether it's representative is to know how were those people that were participants so, so in that survey selected. If you don't, I'll put it a different way, sure. right? Like, so I'm not, I'm not threatened personally that 29% is gonna be a mandate to anybody who seriously thinks about this sort of thing, right? I mean, 29% is a small number, 20% is also a small number, right? What I'm more interested in is the dynamics from one election to the next, right? So a lot of the gist of what these election poll guys are saying is that based on previous exit polls, as I understand, right, Trump did better among this particular ethnic group than Romney did. So that still indicate whatever we think the underlying distribution of Trump support among Latinos is. Again, I, you know far more about that than me. But what I'm trying to say is, what's wrong with that particular comparison to say among this particular set of apples compared to this particular set of apples, like at different time periods, um, Trump support is higher in this area, is higher in the later period. I guess I'm wondering where you think that comes from. Yeah. So, uh, well, it comes from a comparison to their previous election poll, the national exit poll in 2012. But my, I guess my concern is, how are we supposed to, as consumers, as social scientists that consume this information, how are we supposed to adjudicate the quality and how much we should put, how much stock we should put into these figures when one, it wasn't designed to speak to subgroups in the first place, so there's noise that gets introduced at that level. And then two, without any information about how people who participated in the polls were selected in the first place. I, I, I don't know if the same uh, approach was used in 2016 as 2012. So um, I guess I would say it may be apples to apples that are being compared. It may not be. Wouldn't it be better if we just had all of the cards on the table and we could evaluate Sure. Where did they come from? Where are they not? Otherwise, and 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 to the point that na the national exit polls uh, make uh, themselves, they come right out and say, "Don't use this tool to speak to subsamples." And so, so and some right. of it's just not a responsible. I'll, I'll let other uh, people talk, right? But I mean, I, I'm not. I don't quarrel with that, right? I don't think it's a representative sample of anything. But that's why I'm saying, like, the, the 29 number doesn't matter so much to me, right? What matters to me is explaining if. If these, if they were, I mean, I agree. Like, it's, it's maybe, maybe they were different, right? But I'm like, I'm. What I'm trying to get at is, do you think that, like, to me, it's a sort of fair comparison to say, okay, well, here's one bad sample conducted in this exact same way as this next bad sample, and here's a difference in how these groups are distributed, right? I mean, that's still meaningful to me because a lot of that non-representativeness is sort of baked into the fact that they're both equivalently bad samples, right? So, I mean, that's just my thing. Like, I, I, I was just wondering if you had a, a line on that, right? Like, and, and so I have no, I have no loyalty to the 29% number. I don't know what that means. I don't know where it comes from. I, I totally agree with you on that, but I, I, the, the effort to look at trends over time, basically, is from a sort of research standpoint, I guess, the sort of attempt to kind of like filter out a lot of that noise and say, okay, well, what's the change in the evident Latino population sampled in this ridiculous way, right, I guess. Can you, can you see what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Okay, so this question goes somewhat similar to the conversation we just had previously. Uh, on your first survey, did you ask about their interactions with this boots on the ground or nonprofits or other mm -hmm. organizations and how that might make them more or less likely to engage in government services or if they use it as a supplement? So in uh, larger sense, it's kind of an interesting question about uh, in nonprofit, private, public uh, provisions of goods if they're cooperative or if they're in competition with one another. Now, that doesn't work in every sector. In health, you know, there's that, but not necessarily in policing. There's not you know, that other type of competition. 
but uh, did you ask the respondents about their engagement with those uh, that step through? So when you say first survey, do you mean with respect to the 2016 Not, election or the very first part that I... Uh, I mean the, the uh, first uh, research. The first okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. section. Uh, I didn't ask them if they were contacted, is that okay. what you mean? Yeah, like, like contacted or if you had any sense of like interaction with the nonprofit groups. No. Okay. I don't know. Questions? No, Pradesa, Pradesa, thank you so much. Thank you.